All right, guys, welcome back to part two of Septemics, going through the scales and levels. Anything you, you want to say before we get started with the slideshow, Jim? Well, I should just say one sentence to introduce myself in case any of your viewers don't know who I am. I am the discoverer of hitherto unknown natural phenomena, which greatly aid the understanding of people, from which I constructed a revolutionary practical philosophic system called Septemics and published it in the book, Septemics, Hierarchies of Human Phenomena. And today I'm going to explain some of the content of that book. All right. Sounds great. Let's get started with the slideshow where we left off. All right. Right. Okay, so the scale of motivation. One of the most important things to understand with anyone is the person's motivation. This tells you a lot. There are seven basic motivations and all the others are subsets of these. Uh, this is a linear scale as opposed to uh, a spiral scale, which means it just goes from one through seven as you would expect. It's a quantum scale as opposed to a gradual scale, which means that you can only be at that level. There's no intervening stage. You're either at level one or level two, there's nothing in between. And specific meaning, this applies to a specific context. So you could ask, what is my motivation toward my mother? What is my motivation toward my father? What is my motivation toward my son? And you could ask, what is my neighbor's motivation toward me? What is my boss's motivation toward me? What is my girlfriend's motivation toward me? So this could be used hundreds of different ways. Uh, and all in a specific context. There is no general understanding of this. It's, it's specific. So let's look at the axis, which is on the right. There's a vertical dotted line. And it tells you that this axis is one of responsibility. So. A person who is very responsible is high on this scale, and a person who is very irresponsible is low on this scale. So this goes from full responsibility to no responsibility. And in the middle, there's a horizontal line at level four, which tells you that it's the dividing line between sane and insane. The person whose motivation is one, two, or three is sane on that subject. A person who is uh, at level five, six, or seven is insane on that subject. Obviously, to become more insane as you go further down and more sane as you go further up. And level four is sort of indeterminate. It's in, in the middle. Now, notice there's a column for purpose. And this has an interesting uh, pattern as far as how it relates to helping people. That's really what determines motivation. Do you want to help all, which is at level one? Do you want to help another? See, not all, but another, that's level two. Do you want to receive help? That's three. That's uh, status. For wealth, that's helping yourself. Five is you want to harm another, that's revenge. Six, suicide, you're harming yourself. And seven is you want to harm everybody. So mm. that's what makes the scale work. Now, notice that there's an element of exchange because anytime you think of motivation, you think of exchange. In other words, if you want to know somebody's motivation, well, what are they going to give me if I give them that, right? That tells you a lot. So at level seven, that person is destructive. He wants to exact payment from everybody. Mm. Now, that's, you can say, well, isn't that crazy? Yes, that's crazy. And up from that is a higher level from that is suicide. 
this person only wants the exact payment from himself. Not as bad. He doesn't want to kill everybody. He only wants to kill himself. Up from that is revenge. This is exact payment from another. So it's a specific person that you want to exact payment from. And at four, that's payment to self. That's a person who wants wealth, wants payment to himself. Level three, status and fame, that's accepting payment from another. When you have fame or status, that's automatically you're accepting payment from another, one way or another. At two, that is repayment of a debt to another. That is what duty means. And three, charity, no payment is required. If a person is charitable, he doesn't require any payment. So that's what sort of makes this go. That is the underpinning of this subject. So going from seven up to one, destruction, which could also be called subversion, is harming people. Up from that is suicide, which is oblivion, which is harming yourself. So a person who's at level six, uh, you know, a suicide is kind of, there's an oblivion in that. In other words, he's not in touch with life, mm. which is why he wants to kill himself. Often that is revenge, which gets mixed up all the time with justice. Right. Many people, who, when they say justice, they mean revenge, when they say, you know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Up from that is wealth, which is how most people are, the middle of the scale. They want money. Now, strictly speaking, wealth could mean more than money because there are ways, there are a lot of things that could be considered wealth uh, that are not money. For example, uh, you have a lot of rich guys who have what is called a trophy wife. The wife is like a trophy to the guy. So she's a kind of wealth to him. And I, there are some women, not many, who have a trophy husband. Mm. So there's a lot of things that could be considered wealth. So although it says money, that's the way it's generally understood. But it could mean other things too. Now, going up from that is status or fame. So you realize that, let's say you have some poet. He's not, he's not trying to sell books. He wants to be known as a good poet. You see, that's a different thing. Or if you have somebody uh, who's a very good actor, uh, he wants the status of being an actor, like Robert Duvall, okay? Right from the beginning in the 60s was a very good actor. He had a well-deserved status as a top actor. So that's fame, that's a different thing from money. It's a higher level. So you could have, Collecting money really is a kind of a crass thing. I mean, anybody can do that. I mean, armed robbers do that, right? And those aren't people who are seeking status or fame. They want to hide out. Now, up from that is duty. Duty means obligation. Uh, and duty comes from the word due. Something, you, something is due, you know, like you pay your dues. You have a duty to pay your dues to the organization, see? Mm. So, so like a person who ha is uh, motivated by duty is because he feels obligation to whatever it is that he has the duty to. Like many people have a sense of duty to family, meaning they have a sense of obligation to the family. That's very common. And at the top is charity, which is love. Now charity comes from the Latin word caritas, which means love uh, in the sense of uh, what you might call platonic love. They have a different word for what we call romantic love. In English, we use one word for both things, which is not as good as the Latin, because they, they, it's, a, it's a distinction that's very important. So now you could say, well, I love my wife, and therefore I'm going to do nice things for her. Uh, but uh, in other words, he has a charitable spirit toward her. You know, she wants to go on a cruise, so he takes her. He doesn't expect anything for that, okay? And he can say, well, it's because I love my wife. So that's what this scale is about. Any questions? Yeah, so just like any other facet of life, the scale of motivation is going to differ on every on all sorts of different things. Like 
working out or your job or just seeing other people what their motivation is towards different things. Am I correct on that? Right. Gotcha. Right. So this is this is absolutely crucial to know when you're dealing with people. And I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. Let's say let's say you have a couple. They're dating. They're talking about getting married. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't it be smart for this guy to know why this woman wants to marry him? Is it because she loves him, which is level one? Or is it because he drives a Corvette, he owns a yacht, he flies his own Learjet, and he lives in a $5 million condominium? That's a different motivation. That's mm -hmm. level four, you see? So figuring that out could be the difference between them getting married and him dropping the relationship. Now, for some people, uh, it's perfectly okay to marry a gold digger, okay? A gold digger is a colloquialism for a woman who's into it for the money. So there's lots of guys who have a lot of money, older guys, unattractive guys, and they're happy to marry a gold digger. So you have some unattractive 50-year-old guy, he's got a million dollars, and he marries some 25-year-old girl. And he gives her a diamond ring, a pearl necklace, a mink coat, and a Maserati, and a credit card. She's happy because she has all that stuff. And he's happy because he has a 25-year-old wife. Mm. So for him, that might be fine, you see? So in all of these scales, it's very personal. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, uh, you know, it could be the other way around. You know, I know of a couple uh, uh an older, rich woman who married a young, athletic guy, okay? It's obvious why they're married. So, um, you know, she, he didn't marry her, uh, you know, because she's beautiful, because she's a lot older than he. So, you know, those things happen, and I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying you need to know the motivation. And... Sometimes the slot that you're in makes a big difference. But generally, the word money motivated is considered a derogatory term. You know, right. there are many people right. say, well, he's money motivated. Okay. And they're saying that, that he only wants the money. Uh, for example, uh, let's say you have a band, right? You don't want somebody only to be in the band for the money. You want him to be in the band because he likes the band. He likes the musicians. He likes the, what you're doing. He has a similar aspiration. You see, there has to be some compatibility. So if that guy's only money motivated, that's probably not a good person to have in the band. It's not going to work. Mm. So, again, it's, it fits. So, uh like if you're in the military and you're motivated by duty, that's what they want. That's level two. As opposed to if you are in, if you're a priest or a minister, then those people could be motivated by duty, but they could also be motivated by charity. Many of those people do it out of love, what you, what you might call Christian love or benevolent love or uh Charity is really the word we use. You know, a guy enters a religious monastery and he devotes his life to this order. Okay, that's all done out of some kind of uh, spiritual love, love of God, or something like that. So, so this is very individual. See, somebody like that who who would be who'd want to become a priest. You don't want that guy to be selling cars for you. You want a guy who's money motivated. To be selling cars that guy's going to sell more cars because he's motivated by the money and that's what you want because you're hiring him to sell cars you see mm -hmm. no i was just thinking um and of course uh, yeah how if you are you know a leader or a manager or any like bot or any type of you know field where it requires you to figure out motivation of people this is just like the written in right here like this is you know no judgment this is what each how each person you know operates and so you have a better understanding of them and so you know how to certain buttons to push to like fit in a puzzle to get them to to you know fill the obligations that's needed 
that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, <clears throat> uh, you know, if you're hiring, let's say you you want to select uh, special forces. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, a lot of people joined the military after 9-11 because they wanted to fight these people who knocked down these buildings. Uh, so if those people are motivated by justice or revenge, that's not a bad thing. Okay, those They're going to go out there and they're going to wipe out Al-Qaeda if you let them. So that's a place where a low motivation could be meaningful. Mm. You could even say, well, how could suicide be a good motivation? There's such a thing as a suicide mission. How about the kamikazes right. in World War II? They were on a suicide mission. They knew they weren't coming back. Okay? So, uh, if a, you know, a person who wants to live is not going to become a kamikaze. Right. So you could say they were suicidal. Now, uh, some of them may have been doing it by duty or by love. You know, it's you have to look at the specific. But I'm saying you have to really look at the details of what's going on, that person in that context, and see how well it works. Mm -hmm. You know, like sometimes you have an athlete, you know, and he insists on being the star of the team. He wants to be, let's say, a baseball uh, team. He wants to be the number one starting pitcher. And he's not going to be happy if you make him the number two starting pitcher because that's status, you see? Mm -hmm. So you might say, well, this guy is not a team player. You see, there's some truth to that. Right. Well, there's some guy who says, you know, uh, I want, want a bat cleanup on the team. You know, you might not want to put it. It might be better for him to bat fifth instead of fourth. So, you know, that's the case for stat. That's the status. I mean, it's changed now because baseball is not what it used to be, but it used to be a big deal then. If you were Reggie Jackson, you wanted about fourth, period. You know, and there was a big controversy over that when he joined the Yankees in 1977. A big Megillah that went on for months until it was finally settled uh, that he was going to bat fourth. See, because the fact that he was the highest paid player, that didn't mean anything, really, because he already had plenty of money. He wanted the status. So you have to find what the guy's motivation is and how does this fit into the situation. Right. It could be too high and it could be too low. Uh, I once was looking for an employee and I found a guy who was grossly overqualified for the job. I mean, this guy was really too good for this job. And I said to him, you're so talented. You've got so much. Why would you want this job? And, you know, he didn't really say anything, but he kind of went away. So, you know, I could see that he was overqualified for that job. So, you know, it could be a situation where it could be an unhappy marriage mm -hmm. to somebody like that. Yeah. You know, some women, some women are happy to just stay home. Like Jeannie Carmen. Jeannie Carmen was Marilyn Monroe's roommate. She was a beautiful woman. She was called Queen of the Bee Movies, okay? And she gave up all of that to marry some guy and have children. And her children didn't even know that she used to be a movie star until very late in their lives. So, you know, for her, that's fine. That's her motivation. She, she didn't particularly want the status or the fame. You know, she was happier just being a wife. So it depends on the person. And that's how you use this. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I can see, you know, just finding your own motivation towards things, you know, it's great. Like, you know, a weight off your shoulders. You're like, okay, this is what makes me tick. I got gotcha. you. Uh, that's yeah. right. And that's true for yourself and for others. And it's right. true for each situation. You should know what your motivation is towards somebody. And uh, that kind of underpins the whole dynamic right without a doubt all right you ready to move on yep all right 
Okay, this scale of control. This is extremely important and that is not obvious to most people. Mm. So let me say this, first of all, control is an inherently good thing. There's no such thing as bad control. There's no such thing as too much control. Most people misassess that. For example, mm. let's say you have a boss, right, who's domineering. He's saying, get up, Smith, work faster, go there, do this, right? So the person doesn't like it and says, yeah, he's a control freak. That's a complete misassessment. Mm. The, the boss is failing to control his tone of voice, his demeanor, the way he communicates to you. See? If he were smart, he would say, Smith, I have a suggestion. Uh, why don't you go over to department three and take care of that problem? You see, and then the guy feels good about it. That's good yeah. control. You see what I mean? Now, most people, they say, well, Hitler was a control freak. No, he wasn't. Hitler was controlling the Jews. No, he wasn't. He was unable to control the Jews, and that's why he wanted to wipe them out. If he could have controlled them, he would have utilized them. Like in the United States, many Jews came here, especially in the 30s, like Einstein, for example, uh, Kissinger. Mm. And it's the United States utilized them. In other words, they were able to control them. And that is a good thing. Now, look, when let's say somebody you like hugs you, he's controlling you. That's a good thing, isn't it? Right? Or let's say your mother kisses you. That's a good thing. It's she's controlling you. Or let's say you go to a masseuse, right? And you get a massage. Most people love that. That person is controlling you. You're paying that person to control your body. So you go to a dentist. You want the dentist to control you. He's going to fix your tooth. So he says, sit in the chair, open your mouth, and so forth, right? He's con so you're happy with the fact that he's controlling you. So you have to get over this idiotic idea that control is sometimes good and sometimes bad. All success from all people is the direct result of control, okay? So mm -hmm. when you have a pitcher and he throws a 98-mile-an-hour fastball over the plate, Right, and the batter swings through it because he can barely see it. That's good control. He can control the ball. You see? That's mm. what I mean by control. So Tiger Woods could control the golf club. Pavarotti could control his voice. Uh, Rubens could control the paintbrush and the paint and the canvas. That's how you succeed, by control. So the other thing you have to realize is that control is an absolute function of responsibility. To the degree that you can control something, it's because you are assuming responsibility for it. Like the parent has the baby. The parent controls the baby continuously. The parent is responsible for the baby. If you have a parent who refuses to be responsible for the baby, we call that parental neglect, you see? Or if a guy has a son, you know, he tells his son, now look, son, don't play with matches. You see, he's assuming responsibility for the kid. So he's controlling him. So when there's no responsibility, there's no control, and that's the bottom of the scale. So. Complete responsibility is another way of saying love. When you love someone, you assume responsibility for that person completely. When you hate someone, you assume no responsibility for that person. You know, like, that's why, uh, you know, if, if some guy who really hasn't done anything wrong gets arrested, I feel bad for the guy. But if some guy is a rapist or an armed robber and he gets arrested, I'm glad because you could say, I have the antipathy toward that person. And it's true. I don't want those people running around hurting innocent people. 
So you can say that I don't like those people. Yes, that's true. I don't like them. And, and that's how most people are. Hmm. So I, take... I, there's, a story, right, there's a story in my family where I had one sister who was a beauty queen, literally a beauty queen. Mm -hmm. And so there was some guy in my neighborhood, uh, like a tough thug with a leather jacket, you know, uh, who was sort of attracted by her, like everybody else. Uh, and he came one night and went outside her bedroom window and sang to her. Mm -hmm. Well, my father was furious about this. So the, ne the next time this guy came down the street, my father grabbed this guy by the throat, picked him up and slammed him into a light post and said, if you ever go near my daughter again, I'll kill you. That was the end of it. Okay. So he was protecting his daughter. He hated this thug for going near his beautiful daughter and he got rid of him. So you could say he was assuming no responsibility for this guy. You see? Hmm. So hatred is no responsibility. And love is complete responsibility. And those things determine control. So this gives you the formula for success. If you are having difficulty controlling anything, assume more responsibility for it and your control will improve. Hmm. The so reason people have trouble is because they don't share enough responsibility. Like take some guy, right? He he leaves the door in his house unlocked, right? That's irresponsible. So somebody comes in and, and burglars him, burglarizes him. So so it, he was not assuming enough control over his house. He should have assumed more control by being more responsible by locking the door. You see, that's a very simple application, but this can be very complex. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. I'm, I'm seeing it now because I was just wanted to tie it back to the beginning when you said, you know, the boss that's always like screaming and shouting and trying to, you know, order people around yes. has no, no control over himself. Like most people. That's right. Exactly right. right. Exactly right. There's no control over himself. So right. as you move up the scale, you get control over yourself. And having control over yourself enables you to be responsible for people. So, you know, I have employed many people in my life, and I still do. And I treat them very well. You know, I say, would you please uh, check that part over there? It looks like it wasn't done correctly. I don't say, go over there and fix that. Because I'm assuming some responsibility for the person. See? Mm. So... It's I'm um, so you could say that's very good control. Right. Now would you say with no responsibility of people that do act like that, you know, they have no response they have, it's in the hatred scale. So, yeah. Would you say that they hate themselves also, which is, which is why they have no con no responsibility? Okay, so let me point something out. Notice at the top, this is a specific scale. So this scale only makes sense in a context. Okay. So so you could say, how much control are you asserting in the area of your exercise program? How much control are you asserting with your girlfriend? How much control are you asserting for your clients? You see? Mm. It doesn't have any, it doesn't really make any general sense. But when you put it into a context, it makes tremendous sense. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And, and realize this is a gradual scale, which means they're intervening levels. So somewhere, you know, you could be at level two, very good control, and then you get a little better, you know, it's like 2.1, you see? Mm -hmm. It's gradual. This improves and deteriorates gradually, which quantum scales do not. Mm. Okay? So let me just start at the bottom and go through this, because this is not clear at all. The lowest level is must not control. That's what inhibition is. Okay? Like, I used to know a woman, she wasn't my girlfriend, she was just a friend. And she said, oh, I don't want anybody touching me. I was a holistic health practitioner. She had health problems. I could have fixed her health problems. Mm -hmm. And her, one of my clients went to her and said, you know, this guy's good. You should, 
get some help from him. Oh no, I don't like to be touched. See, that's inhibition. She's inhibitive. She was saying, you must not control my body. So she just kept having those problems. See, that's the lowest level. That's no responsibility. That woman is assuming no responsibility for her health. Mm. See, like, uh, for example, I've had a lot of acupuncture. And I have to tell you, it hurts. Okay? And so I have to assert control over my body to make me go in there and have these people stick needles in me. So not all the needles hurt, but some of them hurt very badly, like a root canal for a short period of time, okay? So I have to have a high degree of control. And that's why I have often said to, to many of my acupuncture friends, you know, acupuncture will never be as big as it should be because most people are not responsible enough to make themselves put up with this. Mm. You have to be willing to lie there and let somebody stick 20 or 25 needles into you. And if they're doing it correctly, they're going to find spots that are going to hurt like hell. Now, the next day, your symptoms will be reduced because that's how it works in acupuncture. I'm just saying it takes some control over yourself to do that. Mm. Yeah, you could definitely say the same about success too because you got to have a high degree of control over a lot of things that you can, personally can do. Right. If you look at the, the chapter, right at the end of the chapter, I say success equals control. Mm. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. If you are not succeeding, you are not exerting control. Now, I'll give you an example. I was a very good athlete and a multi-sport athlete. I never competed in organized basketball because I'm short. I'm too short to be a basketball player. So that was something where I literally could not control. Mm. You see, these other guys who were six foot five would just go right over me and put the ball in the basket. There's nothing I could do to stop them. So as opposed to baseball, where you can be small and play baseball, like the second baseman of the Houston Astros, he's a little guy. He was an MVP. Okay. Jose Altuve. Yeah, Altuve. Yeah. Yep. He's like my size. So it doesn't prevent him. So, you know, that's a place where he was not prevented from controlling. He does everything well. He feels well. He runs well. He hits well. You know, he does everything well. He has excellent control in the area of baseball. I don't know what his control is like with his family. I have no idea. But in the area of baseball, he's very high on this scale. Anytime you find somebody who's really good at what they do, it's because of control. Mm. That's it. That's mm. the whole secret. So level five, level six, must control. Must control is not as bad as must not control. Must control is compulsion. You know, this guy, that's what a control freak is. Somebody who is compulsive, you know. Uh, oh, no, you can't fix the salad. I have to fix the salad. You know, somebody like that. You're compulsive. And then up from that is cannot control. Cannot control is better than must control. Cannot control is disowning. That's a person who says, oh, I don't have anything to do about that. It's got nothing to do with me. They just disown it. I can't control it. Uh, you see a lot of people do this like with politics. Well, I can't control what these people are doing. So they just disown it. They don't listen to the debates. They don't vote. They don't send money to the candidates of their choice. They're just disown it. See, that's not much control. Up from that is slight control. Now, this is what we call tolerance. When a person can tolerate something, it's because he has a slight control. See, you may not particularly love it, but you can tolerate it. So that's a slight control. Up from that is good control. That's competence. When a person is competent, it's because he has good control. You know, you hire a house painter, he does everything right, you're happy, you pay him. The man is competent. He asserted good control over your house. And up from that is very good control. And that's what we call mastery. So if we see somebody like Jeff Beck playing the guitar, he was unquestionably a master of the guitar, right? He had 
very good control. In fact, he may, some people might say he had full control. I don't really think that's tr true, but that's level one. So he certainly was a master of the guitar, like John McLaughlin, Eric Clapton, people like that. They're masters of that instrument. Then when you get up to full control, full control is creation. Mm. So this is something most people never get to. I had a friend who was a famous jazz musician. I'm not going to mention any names. He invited me to his house one day, and we're all sitting around uh, drinking our beverages and eating. And, you know, and he sits down at his grand piano with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth and just played. No music no song, he just played all kinds of different things for an extended period of time. It was unbelievable. He just went from one thing into the next thing. It was creative. In other words, he, I was there and I saw it. He had full control over the piano. Mm. It's like he could have done anything with it. So, did he love playing the piano? Obviously. Was he assuming responsibility? Sure, he was. So when you see somebody who's meticulous, you know, the guy who, uh, you know, like many musicians, they have a piano delivered to the venue, and then they have a piano tuner come in and tune it. And very often that's in the contract. They're assuming complete responsibility. They don't want to run the risk that the piano went out of tune when they moved it. You see? Mm. They love what they do. So they pay a guy to come in. It costs some money to hire a piano tuner. It's, it's, it's a big job, tuning the piano. Big job. It takes hours. Of course, the more out of tune it is, the longer it takes. So when you're talking about a good piano, it's not that big a job. But still, that's full control. And sometimes you can see somebody who's absolutely exquisite at something. And you, and you could say, wow, this guy has full control of this. You know, like sometimes like uh, Monet, who's my favorite painter, he painted hundreds and hundreds of fantastic pictures. Many times he painted the same thing multiple times. And the pictures were slightly different. He, he, in my estimate, obviously the man is dead. We're never going to know. But I think he had full control. I mean, he was a genius. So he was creating. He had, he had a distinct style that he created because mm -hmm. he had full control. And uh, if you like art and you go see these paintings in a museum, it's like, wow. You mm -hmm. know? That's the story about control. Don't think control is bad. If somebody's doing something bad for you, it's because they're failing to control. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a friend in Midtown Manhattan, walking down the street in Midtown Manhattan. Guy comes up to him, pulls a gun on him, says, give me your wallet. He said, you can shoot me if you want, but I'm not giving you anything. And the guy ran away. So this friend of mine asserted a high level of control on this criminal, okay? And the guy just ran away. He could have shot him, but that's a very, very high level of control. Mm. So it just sounds like when you're in control, you're able to control everything around you. Right. And that's the more right. control you have, the more you're going to permeate that situation or whatever it is you're doing. That's mm. right. It's all tiny. I see. All, all makes sense here. Okay. Next. Okay. The scale of stopping. Some people might say, what, what's the scale of stopping? What are you talking about? Now in this context, oddly enough, stopping is the only correct word because it means both prevent and discontinue. In English, the word stop means two things, like you could stop smoking, which means discontinue smoking, or you could uh, stop someone from setting your house on fire, which means you're preventing it, okay? But both of those things are inherent in this scale, which is 
very interesting to me. Let's look on the right where you see the dotted vertical line. Now, at the top is freedom, at the bottom is entrapment. So when a person is entrapped, he has a lot of trouble with stopping, either stopping things from happening or stopping things in himself. When a person is free, which is the opposite of, of entrapment, he's in control of the whole subject of stopping. Mm. And I'll, I'll, I'll go through this in a minute to tell you exactly what I mean. Well, first of all, I want to point out, this is a spiral scale, which means there is an apparent congruence between level one and level seven. Now, a person who's compulsive must not stop, like an alcoholic, okay? He just keeps drinking and drinking and drinking until he passes out, okay? As opposed to cannot be stopped. Cannot be stopped is what the word invincible means, like Alexander the Great. He just kept conquering everybody until he ran out of things to conquer. He was invincible. So it's easy to sort of confuse those two things. So people right. sometimes make the catastrophic mistake of seeing a person who's compulsive and thinking he's invincible, or seeing a person who's invincible and thinking he's compulsive. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it does happen. What's the uh, so, differentiate between those two? Well, look, a guy who must not stop, this is a seriously sick person, okay? This person is, at a minimum, extremely neurotic, probably psychotic on the relevant subject. Um. As a person, a quote post to a person who's invincible, that person, he can't be stopped. I mean, he's on easy street. Mm. Now, let me point out in the middle, there's this line that separates the two, sane and insane. This is a very distinct line. A sane person is either at level one, two, or three. An insane person is either at level four, five, six, or seven. And I'll show you what I mean. Okay. So we talked about the compulsive person, right? This guy, let's say you have a serial killer, right? Mm -hmm. A guy goes around like Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper went around the streets of London killing young women. Many of them. That's a compulsion. Okay? Or like somebody who's a child abuser. Okay? He can't stop himself. That person is seriously sick. That person is diagnosably mentally ill. Off from that is must stop. Must stop is the suppressive. This is a person who must stop you. Okay? It's like on a jihad. If you remember Moby Dick, I don't know if you read Moby Dick, it's about Captain Ahab, who is on this jihad to catch Moby Dick, the white whale. So that was must stop. Moby Dick had bitten off one of his legs. Uh, and so, like the rest of his life, he went around with this must-stop Moby Dick. And that's what the whole story is about from the point of view of a plot. That's mm. level six. That's a very sick person, okay? Not as bad as seven, but sick. All from that is stopped. This is the type of guy who just sits in his house and does nothing. A person who's at the this level might not even eat. This is apathy. So uh, this person is stopped. So let's say you have a guy, he's completely given up trying to get a date with anybody. Okay? He stopped. That's apathy. Apathy means literally no feeling from the Greek. So a person is just stopped. He's stuck. That's five. Again, that's quite sick. It's not as bad as six, and it's not as bad as seven. Up from that is cannot stop. So cannot stop, uh, this is like the person who has some horrible behavior, they, like a person who can't stop eating. You know, the guy's 100 pounds overweight, and he just keeps eating. That's abnormal. You see? 
hey, that guy's not sane on that subject. If he were sane, he'd say, you know, I need help. I got to stop this. But he cannot stop. Or an alcoholic or a drug addict. They cannot stop. They literally cannot stop. And that, of course, is abnormal. So when we see somebody who's fixated on something, we see that it's abnormal. Hmm. Then you cross over into the same band and you come to can stop. A normal person can stop. He can stop eating. He can stop drinking alcohol. He can stop taking drugs. He can stop losing his temper, whatever it is, he can stop. That's a normal person, right? So you have a guy, let's say he's ignoring his lawn. He's ignoring his lawn. And he says, you know, I've been ignoring this lawn long enough. I've got to go out and take care of it. So he can stop ignoring his lawn and he goes out and mows it. See, that's sane. That's what we call a normal person. Now, up from that is can be stopped. That's a successful person. Now, we would say, well, how is can be stopped successful? The successful person realizes that he can be stopped, but it's only a potential. See, uh, when Aaron Judge last season, he was the MVP of the American League, went up to bat, he knew he could be stopped, but he still hit 62 home runs, which was a league record. That's a successful person. So uh, a person who blithely ignores all the difficulties is not going to be successful. A successful person knows that he can be stopped and he deals with that. Okay. That's what, that's what success comes from. You can be stopped. Like a boxer, right? He's going to go in the ring. He's going to box this guy. He knows he can be stopped. And because he knows he can be stopped, he trains for three months. He watches his diet. You know, he does all the successful things that boxers do. Okay. He works out a strategy. He watches the other guy's videos to see how he boxes, you see, because he's aware he can be stopped. And that's what makes him successful. So lackadaisical people are lower on the scale. Lackadaisical people are not successful because they're not paying attention to the fact that they can be stopped. And there are many famous stories about this. Joe Lewis, for example, who was the heavyweight champ, after he became champ, he trained for one bout and he was goofing off. He wasn't training the same way. His trainer said to him, look, you're goofing off mm. and, and this is not a good thing. You got to get back to training the way you trained for the past 10 fights. Okay. Lewis said, don't worry, I'll win. Lewis got beat. And so Lewis, when he's getting beat, he's sitting on the bench in the corner, right? And his trainer is attending to him, to getting ready. And Lewis said, what should I do? And the trainer said, you already did it. Uh. Meaning... You didn't prepare properly for this. Hmm. It's like it, Tyson. Lewis, yep. Lewis lost sight of the fact that he could be stopped. And because of that, he was stopped. So then he had learned his lesson and he went back to training the way he had always been training. And he went back to being successful. He won the next fight and many following after that. So that's an example of how this works. Do mm. you have any more examples now, of cannot be stopped besides Alexander the Great? Yeah. Let's say this. I was just thinking baseball. Uh, I was just yeah. I was just thinking baseball that year that um, Barry Bonds hit seventy three, regardless of you know what you thought of his PED use that year. Wait, that was like almost the definition of you could not stop that guy. You That's could not right. reach to him. They actually walked him. Yes. The base is loaded because they couldn't stop him. They right. gave him a run batted in and another base rather than run the risk of him hitting a grand slam because they were ahead by more than one run. So that's the highest praise you can get. 
you know, now in baseball, while we're on the subject of baseball, players also, also say, this pitcher is unhittable. Like, for example, uh, Sandy Koufax at his peak. Mm -hmm. He was unhittable. The Dodgers beat the Yankees four straight in the World Series. And Koufax pits the first game and the first game and the fourth game. There was nothing you could do with him. He was invincible. Mm -hmm. He could throw a curveball in a spot that right on the corner, even if you hit it, it didn't do any good. And it was a strike. So he was he was unhittable. That's the word they use. Unhittable is a synonym of invincible. Mm. Mm. Another example is the Beatles. John Lennon famously said, circa 1965, I don't remember the exact year, we have a license to kill. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. And what he was saying is, we're invincible. They put out an album that was white. It had nothing on it. It didn't even have printing on it. It had the words of the Beatles embedded in it, if you looked carefully, okay? And it went platinum before it hit the stands, even though it was a double album. So mm -hmm. they were, at that time, invincible. So there was like the Beatles and there was everybody else. Mm -hmm. their, yeah. their success, their success was greater than any recording artist had ever had before, and it's never happened again. They could not be stopped. They just kept putting out records and people just ran out and bought them. And, you know, they were invincible as a, as a band. Mm. Mm. I see. I see. So, yeah. so again, you know, that doesn't happen very much. Not many people ever get to that level. And right. remember I told you before, most people don't really understand the top and the bottom of these scales because they're outside of their reality. They're outside of the, the view of life that they have. So they don't really understand it. Uh, it's, it's mysterious. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like that mysterious. It just seems like that you think there's got a lot of things that, uh, go into it like talent your work ethic all these things have to come into play right right but uh when you're talking about the extremes of the scales they are outside the realm of most people's understanding mm. um you know like for example a serial killer somebody who must not stop he compulsively kills women he gets a woman and he strangles her. Then he gets another woman. He can't stop himself. So most people don't understand that. It doesn't make any sense to normal people, is what I'm saying. And because you have to realize that person is really insane. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't get any crazier than being a serial killer. That's, that's as crazy as you can get. Mm. There are many people in insane asylums who are higher on the scale than serial killers. Like a guy who's a catatonic, he's a level five. He stopped, he doesn't do anything. He doesn't talk, he doesn't go outside. He just sits there or just lies there. You know, he's apathetic. And the guy's catatonic. He's in an insane asylum for the rest of his life, but he's still two levels up from the bottom of the scale. Wow. So a lot of what you see in this book is how crazy can people be? See? And so it's, you know, it's not a pleasant thing to contemplate, uh, but it's good to understand it because then you understand what's going on. Right. Yeah. Just even thinking about it, it I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's a topic to, or a right. place where most people won't even, like, fathom. Like, right, even... exactly. Good word. Yeah. And again, it's a quantum scale. You're either at level one or level two. Okay, there's no intervening stage. 
There's no graduation here. It's just you're either one level or you're at another level. So you'll see this like a person who's in therapy mm-hmm. will be at cannot stop, right? And he has a lot of therapy and he suddenly goes boom and he's at level three, can stop. You know, like a guy who's a drunk, right? And he gets there and then one day he says, you know what? I can stop. He went from four to three and he stops being an alcoholic just like that. I know a guy who was a heavy smoker since he was a teenager. And this was before it was known that cancer caused many, uh, cancer was caused by smoking. Not only cancer, heart disease, other things. It was like, you know, a lot of people didn't know. So at one point, he just stopped. He just, he just absolutely stopped. And I don't know what he did, how he did that. Most people can't do that. Most people who are heavy smokers cannot just stop. He just did one day, he just threw cigarettes away. That was it. He went from cannot stop to stop. So he crossed over that line. You know, most people, when they see people smoking today, they think, this guy needs a psychiatrist. Smoking? He's killing himself. He's going to die of emphysema or cancer or or heart disease or something at an early age. That's what happens to those people. So uh, it's reasonable to look at somebody who is in a state of cannot stop, whether it's tobacco or alcohol or heroin, and say, yeah, this guy is nutty. Mm -hmm. Just like the person that, you know, not just cigarettes, but partakes in activities that, you know, just setting them back and you're wondering why they can't, why you can't stop that. And right. They can't stop it. Gotcha. Right. And it's, right. and you said it's hard to graduate up to a level. It's very, most of the times it's just very rare. No, no, no. You can change level. This is a specific scale. So you can change levels. Okay. The, the point is that there's no intervening point. You just go from oh. can stop to can right. be stopped, period. Yeah. Gotcha. It happens so, in a split second. Gotcha. So there's no like um four, you know, four point five to three point. That's right. Yeah. Gotcha. There's no four point five. Yeah, it's just three or four. Gotcha. Makes and I've worked I've worked as human development engineer and I've seen people do this right in front of me. You know, the guy is in a bad relationship, he's in a bad relationship, he's in a bad and one day he says, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. I've yeah. had clients, clients who work with me, and they went home and got a divorce. And were much better off instead of being in a bad relationship, mm-hmm. which is, you know, ruins your life. And I see the guy go, oh, just like that, he changes. Mm. Okay, next. Scale of scholarship. Okay, this is really important because it's about learning. Now, everybody is involved in learning, even if you never went to school. Let's say you have some Native American living 500 years ago, right? They didn't have any reading or writing. They didn't really have school. But they learned. They learned how to hunt. They learned how to make fire. They learned how to make clothes from the hides. And so. so there was learning, okay? So everybody learns. So high school dropout, as he goes through life, is still going to learn something, you know? He learns how to be an Uber driver, you know? He's learning something. So this is this applies to everybody, not just people that we would think of as scholars, although that's the name of the scale. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a linear scale, meaning there's no apparent overlap between one and seven, which is good. It's gradual, meaning there are intervening stages. You work little by little up. And it's general, meaning this does not apply to different contexts. You know, it's like either you're a good student or you're not a good student. It's a general scale. Uh, So this is about interest. The, the, The thing we're measuring here is interest. A person who is an avid student, that's level one, has maximal interest. He's intensely interested in learning or at least learning the subject. And a person at the bottom, what I call a non-student, has minimal interest. 
uh, you can't say no interest because there's always some interest. I mean, even a catatonic uh, in a mental hospital has some interest. I mean, he'll eat, you know, if you bring him food. So that's some interest. So it goes from minimal to maximal. So what are we looking at? As you go down the scale, the person has less interest. Now, here's something interesting. The word student is a similar synonym of the word scholar, right? If you look at the scale, it has students at every level. Student comes from the Latin verb studere, which means to desire. A student is someone who has desire. So when, for example, uh, Seneca, the famous Roman philosopher was teaching, the people who came to him desired to learn. See, they had a desire to go to him and sit in on his porch where he taught and learn what he was teaching them. So that's what this is about. A student is someone who desires to learn. What, what is the desire to learn? The desire to learn is interest. That's what it is. Mm. So let's start at the bottom, a non-student. There are non-students in every classroom in the world. They have no reason being there, really. They shouldn't be there. They're there because somebody is forcing them to be there, the parents or the shrewd officer or somebody, okay? These people will not learn. These people, these are people who are interested in drugs, alcohol, sex, robbing stores, things like that, okay? They're non-students. They're not going to learn. It doesn't matter how good the teacher is. It doesn't matter how good the textbook is. It doesn't matter whether or not he shows up for class. He's not going to learn because he's a non-student, meaning he has no desire to learn, meaning he has no interest, okay? So... It's actually better for somebody like that to not be in school. Because when he finds out what the real world is like, he may desire learning. There's a famous uh, intellectual, Dr. Thomas Sowell, has a doctorate in economics. He's not retired. He was the high school dropout. All right, a penniless high school dropout. And he went to work and he was so poor, he couldn't afford to take the subway home, so he walked. That's how poor he was. And when he, when he went through that, he said, wait a minute, I'm not doing this. I'm going back to school. And eventually, he went to Harvard, he went to the University of Chicago, and, he'd be, and he wrote innumerable books. I don't know how many books, many, and hundreds of articles. And he's a world-famous person now. Perfect example of a non-student who was able to figure out that he should become a student and fix it, fix his life. Most non-students are people who become criminals, drug addicts, and so forth. These are people you don't want around you. This type of guy, if you invite him over, he'll steal your silver when you're not looking. Now, up from that is the facile student. The facile student is a very dishonest person. This is pretended learning. There are millions of these. This is the type of guy who will say to you, you know, I took algebra and I passed, but I don't remember anything from algebra. He was pretending to learn. Now, some of these people will cheat on their exams, but even if they don't cheat on their exams, they're still, it's still pretended learning. Like there are people who can regurgitate the information. They're only, getting the information so that they can get a grade so that they can go on to the next thing. So it's a facile student. There's no depth to these people. You, you, I, I have worked as a tutor and I can tell you, I can spot these people right away. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, like say you, I'm tutoring somebody in math, which I did many times. Uh, and you say to the guy, do you understand the Pythagorean theorem? We'll say, oh, yeah. Okay, uh, look, here's a triangle. I'm giving you side A and side B. Tell me what side C is. And he goes, like Jackie Gleason, hama, 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 hama. You know, he, he can't use it. He doesn't know the Pythagorean. He might be able to recite it, you see? 
that's pretended learning. So hmm. there's lots of these people and they're, 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 they're for, because their parents want them to be there or they want to get a high school diploma so they don't look stupid or they want to get a college degree so they can get a high paying job. These people are even in college. There's lots of them. Up from that is the poor student. Now, the poor student is somebody that's easily identifiable. He does not like to learn. Why doesn't he like to learn? Because he doesn't have interest. If he were interested, he would like it. You see? So this is somebody who's a poor student. Now, the poor student is better than the fast house student. The fast house student very often gets better grades than the poor student. Hmm. But the poor student can be helped because you can identify him as a poor student. You know, guy gets D's. He doesn't like going to school. He gets D's. He's a poor student. He's not a phony. He's just not a good. Maybe he's dyslexic. We don't know why he's a poor student, but he is a poor student, and he, and he, by definition, does not like to learn. You can find out really easily what level somebody is at by just asking this. You know, do you like school? Nah, I don't like school. This is somebody who's at probably five, six, or seven because he doesn't have the interest. Then up to that, we get to the average student. The average student is willing to learn. You know, oh, okay, you're going to teach me geometry? Okay, good, show me. See, he's willing to learn. He'll, he'll pass the course. He's not a phony. He's actually going to learn something. Then up from that is what we call the good student. The good student learns well. This is the type of guy, he does his homework assignments, okay? He hands in his papers on time. He learns well. You tell him something, and he will say, Oh, I see. He's a good student. Up from that is a very good student. The very good student not only learns well, he likes it. He wants to go to class. This is the type of guy who is happy to get to class. He's all excited. He shows up ahead of time with his pencil sharpened, his eyeglasses on. He likes to learn. It's fun for this guy. That's why he's a very good student. He has a lot of interest. And above that is an avid student. The avid student loves to learn. This is the type of guy who will uh, read past midnight and he's erect the next day because he loves to learn so much he couldn't get himself to put down the book. That's an avid student. So that person obviously will will do very well. He loves to learn. Any mm -hmm. questions? Yeah, no. This just pertains to school. Because I've known people, you know, before reading this book that not, couldn't stand school. Didn't, but outside of that, they love to learn on their own. Like they love to read other people's books and all that kind of good stuff. You know, books on skill sets. Well, as I said earlier, it does oh. not pertain only to school. It pertains to being outside of school, too. Mm. Uh, you know, for example, I went to a cocktail party some years ago, uh, and there was a guy there who had lived in China. Now, this was before globalization. It was extremely rare in the United States to meet anybody who had lived in China. This was the only person I had ever met who lived in China for mm -hmm. some time. And I said, oh, tell me about it. I was all ears, see? I wanted to learn from this guy. We weren't in class. So I said, oh, tell me about it. Really, tell me more, you know? And he was happy to tell me. That happens to me all the time. I bump into people who know something that I don't know, like archery, for example. And I'll say, oh, tell me about this. How does this work? You know, I'm interested. So it's not only in school. Gotcha. Makes sense. Yeah. But let me say one other thing about that. I want to say one other thing about this. Mm -hmm. uh, that's re really, really important. Because remember, I wrote this book to help people. Most people have children, and most children have trouble in school. So 
if your student is not an avid student, if he's an avid student, you can tell. He tells you, yippee, I'm going to class. And he gets straight A's, right? Mm -hmm. He might get a B once in a while, but he's an avid student. But if he's not an avid student, the parents need to use this because let's say little Johnny is having trouble in school. So dad says, come here, Johnny, let me show you something. And you show him the scale. Well, the kid's a, the kid's a scholar. He's going to school. He's going to say, you mean there's a scale of scholarship? And he say, yeah, you're a student. Where are you on this scale? And he's going to look at it. And as is usually the case, he'll find a bracket in a matter of seconds. He'll say, well, I'm definitely not a non-student. And I'm definitely not an avid student. See, he just threw out two levels. And you say to him, OK, so let's have you read this chapter and see if you can spot exactly what kind of a student. Are. And he's going to want to do that because he's a student and he's having trouble. And you're showing him a way out of this problem. So he reads it. And then you say, OK, now, tell me now. Look at this. Where are you? And he'll say, well, I can see I'm a poor student. I don't like to learn. I would rather play softball and look at video games. See? Mm -hmm. So he's spotted his level. Now, the dad can say, OK, I'll help you with this. Let's move you up to being an average student. And when he gets to being an average student, he will be willing to learn. Mm. Now, I tell you with specificity in this chapter exactly how to do that. So every parent listening to this, if you want to help your kid get scholarships or get into Ivy League schools, this chapter tells you how to help them. It's detailed and it's specific and it works for everybody. So if he's a poor student and you make him an average student, instead of getting C's, maybe he'll be getting B's. You see? Mm -hmm. If he's an average student and you move him to be a good student, maybe instead of getting B's, he'll get A's. So you realize you're doing this without hiring a tutor. Mm. Wow, that's that's powerful for sure. Because I know I know most people, you know, they don't being a parent myself, I know they're not too fond of like the schools and all of that, but it's a necessary requirement for sure. Yes. And if you follow my advice in this chapter and also in the chapter on the scale of literacy, both of these chapters are close, not identical, but pretty similar. If you follow the advice in those two chapters, your children will love you for the rest of their lives because they will realize that you made them better students and to use a generalization, smarter people. Mm. Mm. Next. Okay, the scale of literacy. So literacy is extremely important. Now realize when we're talking about literacy, uh, general, people generally think of this in terms of reading, but it goes beyond that. It goes even into speaking. Like, for example, I don't know any Swahili. I don't know a single word of Swahili. So in Swahili, I'm illiterate. Right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, uh, I can't even speak a word of it. So it does have to do with not only reading and writing, but speaking. So you can spot a person's literacy just by listening to him speak. For example, if you listen to somebody like Jordan Peterson speak, mm -hmm. it's patently obvious that he is high on the scale. Now, what is literacy about? It's all about comprehension. So on the right, you have have the dotted vertical line. At the top is total comprehension. At the bottom is no comprehension. So a person who is illiterate has no comprehension. And a person who is paraliterate, which is the highest level, has total comprehension. So that's what you're measuring here. How much comprehension is going on here? Like this is something they talk about, reading comprehension. Person reads something, how much of it does he comprehend? 
Now, notice the two horizontal lines. There are dividing lines here. Now, in uh, sociology and anthropology, they talk about three levels of society. A society is either primitive, barbaric, or civilized. And it corresponds perfectly to literacy. Mm -hmm. So if you have people who, have, who are illiterate, they're primitives by definition, like the cavemen. So you could say, well, they had no reading or writing. They could barely speak. They were primitives. Then you come up with, with that into the area of barbaric. This area is far more populated than most people think. And I'll explain why in, in a minute. Above that, you get into civilized. So people who are at levels one through four are civilized. So obviously those are important. They're important in assessing a person. They're important in assessing uh, countries, societies, organizations. So for example, uh, if you go into like the mafia, right? Mm -hmm. These are barbaric people. They're all either semi-literate or sub-literate. And if you listen to them speak, it's clear. That's why they're professional criminals. Mm. So let's start. I started the bottom. I talked about the illiterate. Let's go up to sub-literate. Now, sub-literate is a beginner, like a little kid. He's just learning how to read and write, you know? This is a C. Okay, this is an A. Okay, this is a T. And if you put them together, it goes k at cat, right? You're teaching them how to read. Oh, cat, see? Mm. So that's subliterate. So if you talk to a little kid, which I often do as a tutor, you'll see that they don't know many words. They don't know much grammar, right? They're subliterate. It's the whole world of reading and writing is mysterious and unknown to them. They're just sort of, they can do a little bit of it. You know, they can, they can write, for example, one's name. Because that's something they teach you in the first grade. Mm -hmm. Okay, so up from that is semi-literate. Now, this is an area that most people know nothing about. A, a semi-literate person is competent in the area of literacy. There are millions of people with graduate degrees who are semi-literate. There are people in the STEM subjects. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Mm -hmm. People who have STEM degrees who are semi-literate. And I'll tell you a story. I know someone who's a doctor, a friend of mine. And uh, I had read a novel, a very famous world famous novel uh, and so I loved it and just socially I said here just read this book okay you know just the way friends do so I come back two weeks later person hands me the book back and she said to me and I quote I can't read this book now you would think that someone who's a doctor could read a popular novel couldn't do it this person could tell you all about microbiology and surgery. But if you went outside of that even a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, the person was semi-literate. Now, a semi-literate person, this is the type of person, they can read the newspaper or magazine, okay? Uh, they could read maybe some instructions. That's about it. You know, they, they, they're not literate people. Then you cross the line into the civilized band and you have literate. Now, most people think, well, either you're literate or you're illiterate. No, that's a binary choice and it's inaccurate. It leaves out five levels. A literate person is a person who's fluent in the language. So this person can speak the language fluently, can write the language fluently, can understand the language fluently. Okay? So that's what I call a literate person. Then up from that is a very literate person. This is what we usually think of as people who are intellectuals, like William F. Buckley, 
was a famous intellectual. He was obviously very literate. He wrote thousands of columns and something like 50 books. Uh, he was, if you ever hear him speak or read his writing, he was, whether or not you agree with him about anything, that's a separate subject. He was obviously very literate. Now above this is what I call hyperliterate. Hyperliterate is what we would think of as a brilliant person. A hyperliterate person, when he comes across something in the text or in the conversation that he doesn't understand, he knows immediately. There's no vagueness about it. So uh, this person will be going along reading something and he comes across some word that he doesn't know. He will stop and go to the dictionary and look it up. He knows that he does not know that word. Most people tend to gloss over that. They're not sure if they know it. They're not sure if they don't know it. They just go to the next thing. And one of the mistakes that's made in education is that in teaching children to read, they encourage them to gloss over the things they don't know. That is a gigantic mistake. If a kid comes to a word, he can barely pronounce the word. He doesn't know what the word means. Stop. Tell him what it means. Yeah. I do that all the time, all the time with my students. And I'll tell you something that I say in this. I never say to a student, never, do you know what this word means? Big mistake. I say, what is the definition of the word antediluvian? And if I get a blank stare or a big hesitation, I say, okay, let's look it up. Hey, can you give because, me one second though, Jim? Sure. I, yes. I apologize. All right, baby, I Obviously, you're a little girl, right? Yeah, my little girl. Yeah. Cute little girl. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. So, she's obviously working her way up the scale little mm -hmm. by little. Uh, but don't think because a guy has a graduate degree that he's literate. It's not true. I have a friend who I went through uh, prep school with. This guy was an absolute whiz in anything like science or math. And when he graduated, he went on to college and took a, became a physicist, okay? This guy struggled with anything that would be considered literate. High, history, English, he, he, he could barely do it. He obviously was not literate. Now, I've, this is long ago. I didn't know this material. I hadn't discovered it yet. But if his parents, uh, they were wealthy people, by the way. If his parents knew this scale, they would have spotted that. And they would have used the instructions in this chapter to make him a literate person. It's not that hard. I tell you with great specificity how to make somebody literate. And... If a, unless a person has some serious mental derangement, like is born retarded or something, or Down syndrome, everybody can be literate. Everybody. You just have to have somebody take the time and follow the instructions in this chapter to make them literate. Take some time, it takes some work, but the person will thank you because you're opening a whole world to them when you make them literate. Now, let's go back to the top, paraliterate. Paraliterate, again, remember I said, the top and the bottom don't usually make sense to most people. Paraliterate is no literacy necessary or no literacy needed. This is a person who's beyond literate. This is a person who's telepathic. This is a person who can just read your mind. This person doesn't need to 
uh, read a book. You can just get it right from your mind without your talking to him. There are such people. So for example, if we're talking about angels, 80% of Americans uh, aver the belief of, of angels. They, they say angels exist. And it's not just Americans, all over the world. They call them as the different things. But most people recognize that there are some beings that in English we would call angels. Angels have no body. They have no brain. But angel comes from the Greek word for messenger. In the Bible, angels would show up and deliver messages. That was their job. That's why they're called angels. So there's no literacy involved with an angel. It's all telepathic. And by the way, angels are not people who have wings, okay, and a halo over their head. They're non-corporeal beings, and they communicate telepathically. Uh, and if you're up to having some telepathy, you can communicate with them. Many people have communicated with angels. It's not that obscure a thing. But you have to realize that they don't need literacy. Think of it this way. Let's say you have a non-corporeal being. He doesn't have to remember. He doesn't have to read a book because he's beyond that. Uh, an angel is a being who does not need to be corporeal. So he's not. So he's at a higher state. He doesn't need to read. A knowledge just flows into him from the other beings he's around, whether they are corporeal or non-corporeal. So that's what paraliterate means. That is a being for whom literacy is not needed. Hmm. Does that make sense? So you could have you could have somebody who is a human being, uh, living in a, in a in a human body who is paraliterate. They can just read your mind. You know, you walk in the room and they say, "Yes, I'll loan you five dollars," and you say, "Wait a minute, I didn't ask yet." That's okay. You don't have to ask. Here's the five dollars. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Now, do you, do you think that's that can happen, you know, every once in a while to somebody or like it, if it's well, usually like more than once or twice and like it's a well, consistent this, thing? This is a general scale, meaning a person has a general level. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you take somebody like Elon Musk, who he has he has two different bachelor degrees. If you listen to him speak, he's obviously a very literate person. You don't have to be, you don't have to have this scale to figure that out. Uh, so he's very high on this scale. So he is at one of these levels. That's how most people are. The person is at the specific level. Now you can change, you can go up uh, and you can also go down. There are people who, you know, I had a friend from Italy and he came to America, he learned English, and of course, living in America, he was speaking English all the time. And he said to me one day, you know, I'm starting to forget my Italian. So from non-use, his literacy in his, in his native language had actually decreased because he had stopped using it. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, like, that happened to me with Spanish. You know, I took Spanish. And then I didn't use it very much. So I've forgotten a lot of it. That wouldn't be much for me to get it back. I could get a book for two weeks and I would be back to where I was. But still, I've dropped a little bit, you know. Now, can that happen so on you all? can go down. What's that? Yeah. And that can happen on all things? Yeah, it right. can happen. It's not common for people to go down this scale. Mm -hmm. But the whole point of education is to move somebody up this scale. And really, literacy facilitates education. Now, you have to realize, even if you're studying chemistry or engineering or physics or math, you still need to be literate because the books are written in English, unless you're in Germany and then they're written in German. 
So a person who is of low literacy is going to have trouble with every subject mm. because the teacher is talking to you in that language. The book is in that language. The test is in that language. So literacy totally undercuts scholarship. Mm. See that. I can see that. Any questions? No, I think that one was uh, pretty straightforward. I, I got that yeah. one for sure. And, and I want to advise your listeners, get hold of this chapter and read it because it tells you in detail how to make yourself more literate. And you will be very happy when you're more literate. Believe me. I started school when I was three and I've been involved in education my entire life to this very day. And I can tell you, being more literate is always better than being less literate. Mm. Without a doubt, I've definitely, yeah, I don't, I don't think you have to be that high up on the scale to know just how much this works for you. We've all had many discussions with people that, you know, have not been that literate and you can, you can clearly hear how they speak. Like you've said, you know, and pull them aside, like, Hey, you know, do you, do you think that's wise to be talking like, or like on that educational level? and not higher up because you want this and this to happen for you, but you sound like this and this, and that's just, it's not going to work out because you don't, you sound illiterate. So you right. say exact words. By, by the way, I happen to know because I studied this, most professional criminals are people of very low literacy. If mm -hmm. you go into the background, somebody like Sammy the Bull Gravano, who was second in command uh, under John Gotti in the Gambino crime family. Uh, he was a professional murderer and he turned state's evidence, which is how they got Gotti, how the feds got Gotti. Well, Gravano was a very poor student. You know, he was such a poor student that they put him in some special class. Well, and then he wound up dropping out. That's, that is the norm when you're talking about criminals, whether they're an organized crime or not. That is who criminals are. There are people who are not literate. Because if you're literate, you can become a dentist or a doctor or a lawyer or a physicist or whatever you want to be, and you can make money without shooting people. Mm. Yeah, that's definitely like a nice little phrase there. The more literate, the more doors open up. Yep. Next subject. Okay, his scale of human ability. This scale is extremely important. Uh, it's more important than you can imagine at first blush. Um, this is a, a scale that talks about how much ability a person has. Now, I don't wanna go too much into this, but notice it says there, this scale aligns with the scale of management. Mm. Uh, and then on the right there, it says organization level. Well, management and organization are two ways of saying the same thing. But the point here is that we ran into this once before, one of the earlier scales. I believe it was the scale of identity, which, which uh, is aligned with the scale of allegiance. It's, a, it's an individual way of saying it and a group way of saying it. The scale of human ability is the individual way of saying it. The scale of management is the group way of saying it. And these dovetail. So they dovetail in an, in an odd way. You'll notice that the scale of management runs backwards. It goes seven, six, five, four, three, two, and it's out of, out of alignment and one is at the top. So this was an interesting thing for me to figure out how this works together. Hmm. But this is really important because if you have any kind of an organization, if you're running a business or managing a business, you have to select people according to what their ability is. So you get a good fit. Uh, so let's just go to the bottom and I'll explain these levels and then we'll come back to that. So the lowest level of human ability is an ignoramus. An ignoramus is someone who doesn't know that he doesn't know. This person is a fool. 
You know, like, let's say you have somebody doesn't know anything about martial arts at all, right? There aren't too many people in the United States like that anymore. But 50 years ago, there were plenty of them. So if he walks down and he sees a sign that says jujitsu, he has no idea what that means. You know, he might come into your, into your dojo and say, what is this, some kind of sushi? See, he makes a fool of himself because he has no idea what he's talking about. Okay. You can't even sell something with this person. He's so dopey. All you can do is interact with him. You can say, well, yes, this is my school. I'm a jujitsu teacher and people come here and I teach them. Well, what is it? Well, it's a type of way of, of defending yourself. It comes from the Orient. Oh, I see. See, so he's an ignoramus. Now, if you interact with him, eventually he'll come up to being a layman. Like a normal person, a regular person knows what jujitsu is, whether or not he's going to take courses in it. See, that's a layman. Now, the difference between a layman and an ignoramus is that a layman has a frame of reference. He is a consumer. He can consume it. You can promote to him. You can say to a layman, like, I have never taken martial arts courses, right? I was trained in boxing, which is a different, uh, is a Western, it's a Western system. So uh, if I, I could bump into somebody who, let's, let's say, uh, has a, a dojo where he teaches Aikido, and he might say, why don't you come down? And I'll teach you how to do this, you see? And I might say, okay, you know, sign up, take some classes. You know, I'm a consumer. I know enough that he could promote to me. You can't promote to an ignoramus. Mm. He doesn't know enough. Mm. Well, layman, you can promote to. See, like, like the average driver, many women don't know anything about automobiles, more so than men. And that's just because they're not interested in it, they're not exposed to it, whatever. You know, like, uh, if I've, many times I've asked female friends of mine, oh, what kind of a car you have, have, you have? And they'll say, a blue one. Well, tell me about it. Yeah, it has, it has uh, windows that go up automatically, you know, and it has a nice stereo. That's what they know about cars. Now, not too many guys are like that. Most guys will tell you, well, it's it's a V8, you know, so it's 350 horsepower, you know. So uh, it's, it's a very different conversation. But uh, you really can't do anything with an ignoramus. He just, he's just, he doesn't have a clue is the best way to put it. Whereas the layman... He's a consumer. You can promote to him. You know, you can show him, say, you know, come down, I'll give you a free class. Okay, you know, you're promoting to him. Now, five is an amateur. You could also call an amateur a dilettante. A dilettante is somebody who dabbles in something and is not an expert in it. He's not, he doesn't know well enough to, to do it professionally. In other words, like uh, I had a friend who painted. You know, I thought his paintings were not bad. But nobody was paying him for that. You know, he wasn't. He just did it because he liked it. That's a dilettante. Uh, an amateur. Amateur comes from the word for love. He does it because he loves it. Okay. Uh, now, this person, you can sell something. Your best customers are amateurs. If you go to a football game and talk, go around and talk to the men in the stand, you will find most of them played football in their life. They're amateur football players. You see, they played in football. They played in these local leagues that they have. So that those are the people who are going to go to the football game. Those are the people who are going to buy the season tickets. Those are the people who go out and buy a New York Giants football jacket and wear it. See, mm. that's an, those are amateurs. And in any area, there's millions. I mean, how many million amateur basketball players are there in the United States? You know, it's some vast number. 25 million, 30 million, you know? You could just say and those, Right. <laughs> and those people, you can sell them something. You can sell them a, a subscription to the NBA season on, on uh, video or something. You see? 
So those are your best customers. If you find an amateur, sell him something. If you find a guy who, you know, he he's an amateur uh, baseball player, you can sell him a glove, you can sell him a bat, you can sell him uh, sticky stuff to put on his hands. You know, there's all kinds of things you can sell him mm. because he's an amateur. He knows enough to know, yeah, you know, I want to try that sticky stuff. Maybe that will help me get my curveball better, you know? So... You know, that's, that's what amateurs are. That's too funny because I talk to many, you know, fitness uh, fitness coaches and I always say the same thing. Favorite person to sell to is someone that's already worked out before. That's right. He's an amateur. <laughs> that's right. Like me, like me. You know, I'm, I've been working out since I was 14 with weights. So I'm an amateur. I've got the belt. I've got the gloves, you know. They sell me all kinds of things. They sell me new weights, you know, protein shakes, you know. All right. I'm a good customer because I'm an amateur in this field. Okay, so let's go up to level four competent. A competent person is a professional. If he's competent, he can make money from it. For example, there are a lot of people who work a nine to five job, and then on the weekend, they play music for money. I knew many people like that, okay? Now, they were... Uh, competent enough to get paid a hundred bucks to show up at a bar mitzvah and play the saxophone for four hours. Okay. That's a professional. He's getting paid for it. He's competent. Okay. Now up from that is an expert. An expert is a master. This person is not merely a professional. He's beyond a professional. He has some level of understanding that exceeds what a professional would have, would have and a level of skill like if you're talking to about somebody like tiger woods in golf he's an expert i mean he, you know he knows those things about golf that i never even dreamed of you know i'm sure he's a master at it and then up from that you get to the virtuoso you know the virtuoso is an artist he's somebody who's so good at something that it becomes artistic uh, I once knew somebody who was a master chef. And this person cooked for me a few times. Come on over, I'll cook for you. Talking, talking about a person who owned his own, owned several restaurants and was the chef in the restaurants, okay? So now, retired, come on over, Jim. And I would watch this person cook a meal for me from nothing, all right, from absolutely, from, no food. He would start from scratch and cook me a whole meal. It was like watching Rembrandt paint. Okay. It took on a level of artistry. I mean, it was, and many years later, they came up with these cooking shows. You know, these chefs who go on TV and they, and they, they cook things on TV. They're so good at cooking that it becomes an art. So a person, you'll see this in somebody who's, I mean, in the case of an actual art, it's obvious. Like, for example, Eddie Van Halen was clearly a virtuoso guitarist. Anybody who knows anything about guitar will tell you he's a virtuoso. If they know what the word is. Uh, then above that is genius. Hmm. A genius is unique. A genius is irreplaceable. For example, Einstein. Einstein was a genius. In the area of physics, he was a genius. He was unique. There's nobody like Einstein. When somebody's name becomes an adjective, it means he's a genius. We talk about Einsteinian physics. Or physics post-Einstein. Okay, He changed the world of physics. He changed the complete understanding of physics. So, he was a genius. So, Obviously, not many people get to that level. Another example of a genius is Shakespeare. There's nobody like Shakespeare. There's Shakespeare and there's everybody else. Mm -hmm. There are many great playwrights. Arthur Miller, Ibsen, you know, there's many good playwrights. Noel Coward. But none of them are on the level with, right? with uh, Shakespeare. He was a true genius. Mm -hmm. Okay? So those are the seven levels. And of course, this is a gradual scale. So you work your way up gradually. And I give examples in the book of how a person can start at 
seven and work himself up to one. Mm. So I don't want to say too much about the scale of management because that is a separate scale. But the, the reason these two scales dovetail is this tells you what to do with this person. Mm. So uh, the, there are seven levels of organization and those levels of organization correspond to the how to handle section in the middle. So when somebody establishes an organization, that's level one on the scale of management. But then it jumps down to two. And the next thing he, you do is interact. Well, who do you interact with? An ignoramus. Then the next thing, level three, is promotion. Who do you promote to? A layman. Next thing is, is sales. Who do you sell to? Your amateur. See, the next five is your production area. Well, that's the area of a professional. And above that, we get into quality control. And this is the guy who, who can refine the product. He can say, you know, Smith, if you did this this way, you would get a better result faster. And the guy says, oh, I see. You see, that's, that's the expert telling the professional how to do his job better. Now, when you get a virtuoso, what do you do with a virtuoso? You market him. So, like, you have people like uh, Bob Dylan was just some kid bouncing around Greenwich Village, playing in these little coffee shops. And somebody, somebody discovered it and said, wow, this guy is great. And they marketed him and made millions of dollars. Okay, Or Jimi Hendrix is another guy. Jimi Hendrix was kicking around Greenwich Village. You know, he was working as a guitarist. And somebody said, wow, this guy's unbelievable. And they sent him to England. They got him a, a great backup band and the rest is history. So when you find a virtuoso, you market him. And I, I'm reminded of Al Kaline, who was probably the greatest player in the history of the Detroit Tigers played his whole career with the Tigers, never played a day in the minor leagues. He was in the major league team at age 17. Mm. That's how good he was. He was so good. He could do everything. He could hit, he could throw, he could catch, he could run. So they just put him right into the major leagues and he never left. They saw it. This guy was a virtuoso. Mm. Very rare yeah. that that happens. Jeff Beck was a virtuoso guitarist. Definitely. There's nobody like him. You know? So uh, when you get somebody like that, you book concerts, you put them on TV, you know, you market him. That's what you do from an organizational point of view. So mm. that's how. Any questions? No. Um, I can, not really, but I can see crystal clearly on all those levels. Right. I'm now, sure. it's, important, it's important to realize that you do not want to put the person in the wrong place. For example, if someone is an amateur, you don't want to pay him money for it. He's not ready for that. You could make that mistake. You know, you could take some, like I told you about a friend of mine who painted, you know, he was an amateur painter. Somebody could say, oh, we'll do a show for you in my uh, studio. He wasn't at that level. You see? So uh, you want to get, get the person at the right level. And I'll give you another famous example, Tony Bennett, singer. Frank Sinatra said that Tony Bennett was the greatest singer in the world. And in that genre in which they both existed, I agree with him. Uh, so Tony Bennett was a virtuoso singer. His singing, if you like that style of singing, you know, it's, it, it was from the 50s. We, when he broke in, it's like 1952, he had his first hit. You know, it's from that style of singing, for rock. Uh, he was a virtuoso, he was fantastic. Now, you know, late in life, he became a painter. Did you know that? Wow. He took up painting. Hmm. Now, he never became a virtuoso painter. Uh, he did get up to the point where people bought his paintings, which means it was level four. So in this completely different context, um, he was at a different level. Mm -hmm. But still, I wouldn't call this a specific scale because uh, 
it's too it's too generalized uh, in the person's life. In other words, Tony Bennett is an exception. Um, normally, you know, you think of Shakespeare, you think of plays. You think of Einstein, you think of physics, and so forth. Hmm. Uh, you think of you think of Jack Nicholas, you think of golf. You know, he was at least an expert, maybe a virtuoso. I don't really know golf too well, so it's hard for me to say, but but you know, he was way up there. So it's like his whole life. Usually it's like the person's whole life. Mm -hmm. Like Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player who ever lived. He was a virtuoso. Mm. You could watch him do things and say, how the hell did he do that? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, what do you do? You market him. You know, you sign people up. Yeah. Come down and, you know, yeah, people wanted to go to see Michael Jordan. Even if they weren't Bulls fans, they wanted to see Michael Jordan. Yeah. Yeah, that... That's, Any questions? You know, that's actually the, the best definition of a virtuoso right there is Michael Jordan because people didn't even have to watch basketball from other countries. I love Michael Jordan. Or right. Just, that's right. I mean, he just had people just, he just lit people up without even having to be in front of them. That's right. Or like Jeff Beck. Uh, Jeff Beck played to huge crowds. Uh, and he was just, uh, just sublime, you know, uh, so, you know, obviously a virtuoso. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so even if you don't know anything about rock music, you don't know anything about, uh, guitar playing, you can watch or listen to Jeff Beck and say, yeah, that's really cool, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's like, I'll give you an example. I don't really like opera. I've never been to an opera. You know, I, I, I just, I respect it, but I don't, I'm not an opera fan. But when I listen to Pavarotti sing, or plus, what's you know, his name? Placido Domingo, you know, some of these great opera singers, I say, wow, this guy is awesome. Even though I'm not a fan of it, you know? It comes across because mm. you're looking at a virtuoso. Mm. Wow, this guy is unbelievable. You know? mm. Now that's why people line up to, to see that person. Mm. I'm not one of them because I don't dig up, but you know, still I could I could see the greatness in him. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I can definitely relate to that on soccer with uh -huh. Messi. Yep. Without a doubt. All right. Care. All right. Okay, the scale of memory. This is a scale that obviously implies to everyone in a very deep way. Uh, first of all, it's a spiral scale. If you look at level one, it says no memory. And level seven, it also says no memory. The difference is. And at level one, it's no memory is needed. At level seven, it's no memory because you're in denial. Mm -hmm. So you have a guy who goes on a bender, right? He gets, he's drunk for three days. When he sobers up, you say, where'd you go? I don't know. What'd you do? I don't know. How'd you get there? I don't know. You know, he's like in denial. And the whole idea of denial is, it's something that's real, it's true, it happened, but you have no cognizance of it. So that's a person who, you know, just has no memory of the thing, period. Even though it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I want to point out that level four is also no memory. So level one, level four, and level seven. This is what in science we call harmonics. Level four is a higher harmonic of level seven, and level one is a higher harmonic of level four. Uh, at level seven, it's no memory denial. 
At level four, it's no memory forgotten. And the level one is no memory needed. Now, no memory forgotten is a distinct thing. You know, you, 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 say, to some, you say to somebody, oh, you know, I wanted to tell you about this actor, but I can't remember his name. You know, good actor, but I just, just can't remember his name. You know that you forgot it. Mm -hmm. So you have no memory of it, but you know you forgot it. That's different from a person who just has no memory at all of the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you watch people, you will see them manifest these levels. No memory needed. That would be somebody uh, who is probably non-corporeal. I mean, if you have somebody, you know, often you see these transcendent gurus, a uh, Buddhist monks, they don't really do anything. They don't really go anywhere. They meditate, you know? They mm -hmm. drink some water, they eat some rice, and they go back to meditating. Uh, those people don't really need much memory. What are they going to remember? Where they left their keys? They don't have a car. Mm -hmm. You know? What's their social security number? They don't have a social security number. And even if they do, they don't need to remember it because they don't care. So mm -hmm. this, is, this is, again... This is a level most people never get to, where no memory is needed. Uh, you know, if you meditate or you have some big transformational experience, you can get into this kind of a spiritual state where it's just not, you just don't feel a need to remember anything. Uh, it, it, so it's like you have no memory because you don't need a memory. You're just chilling out and enjoying whatever it is. Now. So, so now again, there's a dividing line here between sane and insane. Mm -hmm. Anyone who has le is at level five, six, or seven is insane, more so as you go down. Anyone who is at level one, two, or three is sane, more so as you go up. And when we say up and down, what is this up and down? The dotted line on the right that goes vertically, goes from absolute truth to absolute falsity. So when a person is in denial, that is false because there is a reality that he is not cognizant of. Like a guy is an alcoholic and he's in denial about it. That is a falsehood. You see, the truth is that he's an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. The falsity is that he says, no, I'm not. Now, absolute truth is where you would be in a state where you don't need a memory because you get to absolute truth. I don't know if you've ever attained a state like that. I've been there a few times. And you get into a state where you just don't care about remembering anything at all. It's, a, you know, it's a transcendent state. Yeah. Uh, so let's start at the bottom. So you have a person who has no memory at all. Then above that, you have sporadic delusional memory. So what that means is this guy will remember things, bits and pieces of things, but it's delusional. Uh, and not only is it delusion, it's sporadic. He's not remembering the whole thing. He gets little bits and pieces, delusional things. So this is obviously, isn't, you say, isn't that insane? Yes, it's insane. But it's better than no memory at all. This guy can remember something, and even if it's a delusion. What's that? You, know, you say he remembers like bits and little bits and pieces, but some of it's made up with things that he just made up on his own. Yeah, it's it's. You see, when people go below level four, uh, see, remember, level four is a state of no memory. You forget something. When you go below that. There are people who will, who will, you might say, dub something in so mm -hmm. that there is not a hollow point. They put something there. Yeah. Uh, so when a person can't tolerate simply forgetting something, he'll make something up. And you'll, you'll find this out if you, if you treat people in therapy. Like I would find people that I would be treating uh, as human development engineer would be telling me things that later would turn out to be completely false. Completely. 
<coughs> they were delusional. <coughs> and of course, that's crazy. Now, above from sporadic delusional memory is just delusional memory. This guy can tell you all about it. You know, yes, I was abducted by aliens and they took me to a purple planet. You know, the guy is delusional. So he has memory, but it's completely delusional. That's better than six, which is he can't even remember the delusions. Even the delusions are sporadic. Right. But then when you go up from delusional, you come to no memory again. It's better to have no memory than to be delusional. Yeah. Uh, when you're delusional, you get into a lot of trouble. Now, let me tell you when I talk about delusional. You know, like you find people say uh, that this president is like Hitler. That's delusional. We haven't had any presidents like Hitler. We've had some bad ones. You see, that's people who go around, like people run around saying, all whites are racists. That's delusional. Right. There's millions and millions and millions. Most whites are not racists. That is just a delusion. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that tells you that this can be very dangerous. Uh, you know, there are like all the blacks that got lynched in the South. You know, a lot of them were probably innocent people. And it's because the types of people who would be in the KKK would be delusional. You know, they've got this delusional idea that about black people that's completely wrong, you see? And so it makes them do stupid things, crazy things. Mm. But it's in their minds, so it's a memory to them. Now, I'm going to go up to forgetting. Well, most people understand no memory, forgetting. That's, that's normal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So then you go up to that and you get the sporadic memory. Now, sporadic memory is where you can remember bits and pieces of it. You know, like most people, if you ask them about their childhood, they can remember it's sporadic. Oh, yeah, I can remember the time my cousin and I went to the beach and we had peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, you know. But if you ask them, well, you know, how did you get there? I don't remember. How did right. you go home? I don't remember. It's sporadic. You see? And, and they're not going to just throw in random things that... Right, they just remember random things. I don't know. So that's same, but it's sporadic. Mm -hmm. Then you get up to the state of complete memory. Mm -hmm. Now, this is similar to what we call eidetic memory. This is a person, uh, this, not millions, but there's quite a few people around who uh, can, you know, they can look at a page in a phone book and they can, an hour later, recite back to you the names and the phone numbers in that entire page. It's in their memory. They have complete memory. Uh, there are people who can tell you, uh, like say a guy is a chemist. He can tell you what page in the book gives the answer. That's how good his memory is. You know, well, where can I find the formula for methane? Oh, it's on page 23. So he, he knows it so well, he even gets all of the details with it. Mm -hmm. That's complete memory. Obviously, not many people get that. Uh, but you often will find somebody here who in some specific area, remember, this is a specific scale. He seems to have a complete memory about everything. You know, he can tell you that in 1927, the most valuable player was... Uh, Lou Gehrig, and he knocked in 175 runs. You see? Because in that area, his memory is complete or close to complete. Now remember, it's a gradual scale. He may not remember uh, what batting average Gehrig had in that season, but he can remember that he batted in 175 runs and that he was paid $7,000. Which are, by the way, facts. Those are I'm not making this. Then you go above that to no memory needed. And this is a person in a transcendent state. He doesn't need to remember anything. Uh, so, you know, this is 
what people in meditation or anything like meditation are trying to get to. Mm. Right. And that, that would definitely be based off of want. And I imagine not many people you know, want to get to no memory needed. Right. Gotcha. All right. Um, you know, like, like, for example, some guy gets into some transcendent state and the guy says, you know, I remember Gertrude. He doesn't care about Gertrude, you know? He, he's, he's just floating around in this beautiful state where he's absolutely in present time and space. He looks at the tablecloth, it's beautiful. Looks out the window, it's beautiful. He looks at the garbage pail and it's beautiful, you know? And that person would be in a state of, he doesn't need any memory. He, he doesn't care whether he has a quart of milk in the refrigerator or not. Mm. Mm, yeah. Definitely. Definitely touched on that like a few times, but not not enough to on a daily basis to be like, yeah, I have no need for that. Right. So it's four o'clock. Is this when you want to end? Yeah. Yeah. We'll okay. Be back. We'll be back for part three. Right. And I want to invite your listeners, go to septemex.com where you can uh, find out more about this. There's, there's a lot of information there. And of course, it's all free and you'll enjoy it. Absolutely. Highly check it out. Highly suggest you get the book in the meantime and go to the site. Right, we'll join us back for part three.